I'm going to be dealing with tonight the disobedience syndrome. The disobedience syndrome. Not S-Y-N, but S-I-N. The disobedience syndrome. That's a play on words right there. The disobedience syndrome. Now, why am I looking at this? Because there is a lot of uh, various kinds of um, opinions out there as it relates to what disobedience is. And uh, you will hear people talking about rebellion, disobedience, insubordination, and these words get thrown around in in church a lot and um, sometimes people feel um, offended hurt wounded because they are called names um, by virtue of misunderstandings concerning a person's actions and motives and they and they label individuals in a way that ought not to be done now, I want to look at Jonah, the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah. We're going to be looking at a few things there in the book of Jonah. And so let me see if I can read a few passages for you from Jonah chapter one. And then um, we go into Jonah chapter two. So I'm going to be reading this first and foremost, and then we will get into some things. Jonah chapter one. Those of you who don't know where to find Jonah, he's not in the belly of the fish, okay? <laughs> yes, he's not in the belly of the fish anymore. So please, go to your Bible, yes, and look for Jonah. Eh? So we can say Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastic, Songs of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Eh? And then what comes after that? We don't know what comes after that. Go in your index and go find it. <laughs> yes, those of you who don't know where to find Jonah. All right, good. Jonah chapter one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Very plain, clear instruction. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, I want you, before you move on, I want you to take note of something. The word of the Lord came. Now, you might, you might overlook that and think that that means that, okay, God stayed in heaven and spoke to Jonah. That might be a possibility. It could also be that an angel came with the word to Jonah as the case may be many times angels would come, speak the word of the Lord to the prophet, the prophet delivers. It could also be that uh, Jonah might have heard the voice of the Lord or Jonah might have seen a uh, Christophanic um, appearance of the Lord. Now, it could be any of that. But can I bring your attention to something? And let me take you to something. The Bible says the word. It is not a word. Please note, not a word came to Jonah. The Bible says the word. It's a definitive article. Came. In other words, I'm saying by the spirit that the word person came to Jonah. Are you following me yet? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The word came. It's like saying Bernard came to Jonah. Bernard came to Jonah and said, he came saying, right? That's the word Amar there, which means, which we also get a prophetic utterance from. So he's saying, he's prophesying while he's coming. Now, I want you to picture that. Could it be that this prophet, based on the nature of the 
symbolism of what he's supposed to deliver based on the nature of his assignment to Nineveh, based on what he's supposed to typify in his assignment. Could it be that Jesus appeared to Jonah? Could it be? And I'm just throwing that out there for you to consider that as a point of meditation. Could it be that when the Bible says the word came to, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, could it be not just a voice and a speech and words, uh, intelligible words, but also the person himself that, that located Jonah and spoke to him? You see, the Bible, the Bible is full of double references. The Bible is full of double references. And this is one of the things that when you, when you look at the scriptures um, in terms of dealing with understanding the Bible, a lot of people, they do something, they make a mistake they go into what is called literalism, but literalism becomes strict and rigid letterism. Can I, can I repeat that for you? They go into literalism, but literalism becomes strict and rigid letterism. So in other words, they do not understand that literal interpretation does not necessarily mean what you see before you in black and white. Because literal interpretation could also mean the spirit of that which you are seeing. So for example, Romans 2 verse 29 says, circumcision is of the heart by the spirit, not of the letter. So in other words, you're not going to take a knife and cut your heart open and peel off the outer skin of your heart. That's not what it says. If we believe in literalism, then we should practice letterism. But a lot of people believe in letterism and not literalism. Because you see, literalism, when you talk about literal interpretation, you could, you could employ both the physical and the spiritual meaning of the word. This is why when I teach, I say, let us get what? The spirit of the word. And not just the letter of the word. And by that, I mean letterism, where if it is not written in plain black and white for some people, then it cannot be so. And this is why when you go into certain levels of teaching, some people will not agree with you because they cannot move from black and white to the spirit. The question now is, will we take the spirit to be literal? Is the spirit literal? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Is the spirit literal? All right, let's move on with the, with the reading of the word. So verse three, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Do you, do you see that now? So if you think that what I'm saying is nonsense, how is it then that Jonah, having received the word, is now running from the presence of the Lord? Jonah came into a contact. Jonah came into contact with someone. And we know that someone to be the Lord. That word presence there is the word panim, which means face. So in other words, Jonah came in contact with the word. And we're going to see why I am saying this because of the nature of Jonah's assignment. Please remember, we are dealing with the whole matter of disobedience. Please, let's, let's keep that in mind. So Jonah flee from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them onto Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord. So in other words, instead of Jonah going um, east, Jonah went west. <laughs> so there is no way that going west, he could end up east. 
But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Yes, God sometimes sends trouble. Mm -hmm. I want you to write that down. God sometimes sends trouble. But when and how and why is what we're going to see. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. The man, the mariners were afraid and cried every man to his God and cast their wares that were in the ship into the sea. Why were they doing this? The Bible said to lighten it to them. So apart from lightening the ship, casting their wares into the sea was also to appease the particular God that was angry with them. When you study how these guys travel the seas, you will realize that there were certain things that they did to appease the powers of the waters, right? That is why they have certain images on the front part of their ship, okay? Because they want to make sure they appease their gods. Now, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Now, brethren, please now open your eyes for me. Open your eyes. The Bible is about Jesus. The Old Testament conceals what Jesus will do in the New Testament. If Jonah's story is about Jesus, which it is, when you now read Jonah gone down into the sides of the ship and lay and fast asleep, what, does, what comes to your mind immediately? having being students of the bible and reading the new testament was there a time that jesus was sleeping in a boat on a ship when there was a storm absolutely so these are codes these are biblical codes that speak of actual manifestations that are going to take place when let me just go around the corner here and come back when we talk about dreams, there is no one interpretation of a dream. Excepting the Holy Spirit speaks to you and said, this is it. Dreams are multi-layered. Multi-layered. Visions are multi-layered. They are full of parables and parallels. They are full of secret meanings all over. I want you to understand that. And God can code hidden messages within a message. That's how brilliant he is as an author. And so I'm looking at this and I realize, hey, but Jonah was asleep in a ship when there was a storm. And Jesus was asleep in a ship when there was a storm. So the man's ministry is typifying Jesus in the shadows. He being the type, Jesus being the antitype. All right, let's go on. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Everyone to his fellow. Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lot and the lot fell upon Jonah. Now, my God, I'm flowing tonight. Let's go back to Jesus. Now, this whole story of Jonah, please remember what happened. They cast the lots. The storm was on the, on the sea. Jonah was asleep. And then eventually they would have thrown Jonah into the waters. A fish swallowed him. And three days later, spit him out back. We know later that this typified who? Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. That's how powerful this little story is. Now, this story happened ages before Jesus came. Then one night, Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. And then out of nowhere, a storm came. Now, I want you to see something. The devil 
does not forget. The devil knew that Jonah's story typified Jesus' death and resurrection. Here was the perfect opportunity to reenact something in the opposite. So instead of permitting Jesus to escape that sea, a storm rose up, Euroclidon rose up. Now to do what? Destroy the man who is obedient to God so that he will not reach the stage where he can fulfill what was prophesied about him on the waters. The enemy was ready to destroy him. But instead of throwing Jesus overboard, <laughs> Jesus rose up and said what? Peace, be still. So, a disobedient person has absolutely no authority to speak to things that are coming against him. Why? Because your obedience is backed up with the power of God. The Bible talks about the Lord putting down principalities and powers when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's continue. We're just throwing in those caveats there. So the verse seven, and they were, and they said everyone to his fellow, come let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. What a coincidence. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Where, what is your country? And of what people are thou? And he said, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid. Hmm. Oh, my God. Why were they afraid now? Now that... Um, Jonah said this to them. Let's see. Verse 11. Verse 10, sorry. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm? For the sea was angry and was tempestuous. And he said, take me up, cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. All of these are prophetic symbols here. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. So watch this now. Because of one man, the sea became angry. Because of one man, the earth became angry. The waters became angry. Because of one man, sin entered the world. Because of one man, a ship is about to be destroyed. All of these are prophetic symbolisms. It is typifying for us what happens when a man chooses to disobey God. Adam disobeyed God. The whole world is in trouble. Jonah disobeyed God. An entire ship of men is about to be destroyed. Disobedience is a dangerous, dangerous sin. So watch what happens now. The men try to row hard. They try to appease or try to get out of the situation by their own strength. Isn't that what we do when we become disobedient? When we become rebellious, unrepentant we try to get ourselves out of situations when it becomes sticky so watch what happens now let's continue with the bible the men began to row hard where am i now uh where's that verse 
yes, to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea was wrought and tempestuous against them. Verse 14, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Here's where the men start repenting now. Let us not perish for this man's life. <laughs> what a prayer. I don't want to die for another man's sin. Eh? Eh, all of you who are not, who don't think you are like the men in the ship. Eh, if somebody's going to die for his sin, you want to die with him for something you never committed. Come on now. Eh? Be honest with yourself. Eh? Let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. So in other words, we don't want to die for this man. And we're about to throw him overboard. But when we do it, please don't kill us for doing it. Because we want to spare our life. One man must die for us. We're not dying for him. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. I want you to look at that verse. That phrase. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Wow. Please take note of that. God does what pleases him. And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to send him to the cross. Mm -hmm. It pleased him. Yes. I want you to take note of that. Why would this please God? Because once and for all, sin was going to be dealt with. And if this is going to be dealt with once and for all, God will be happy about that. Once and for all, for all eternity. Now, let's go further. Verse 15, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. What does the sea represent? It represents God's anger against sin, God's wrath against disobedience. And when the sacrifice was thrown into God's wrath, God's wrath stopped. God is no longer angry concerning sin. He's angry about men who refuse the sacrifice that was made. Sin has already been judged. But those who refuse to accept the sacrifice, they too will have to face the wrath of God. But guess what? This time, they will not be able to escape God's wrath. Why? Because they are not perfect. They are not obedient. So there's no way that they can come out of hell and the lake of fire. The reason why Jesus could come out of that place was because when he was examined, there was no reason, absolutely none, to keep him there. Wow. Now, let's go for it. It says, the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now, the Lord had prepared. I want you to look at that. God had prepared a great fish. Not a great whale. A great fish. Please say what the Bible says. It says, a great fish. Never says that a whale swallowed Jonah. Hmm? Your Sunday school books are wrong. It says a great fish. Hmm? Yes, that's a eureka moment for some of you right there. Oh, wow. He said it wasn't a whale that swallowed Jonah. No, a great fish. Yes, a great fish. What a eureka moment for some of us tonight. A great fish swallowed Jonah. Now you might be asking, can a fish swallow Jonah? A fish is not big enough to swallow Jonah. It must be a whale because a whale is the biggest fish of the sea. 
but you miss the part where it says, God prepared. Uh-oh. So if God prepared a fish, it means that this fish is a special fish. This fish was following Jonah from the time he got into the boat, waiting for Jonah to become his meal. God prepared the fish. So if you have a problem with God preparing the fish, then you have a problem with God also creating the world. And you have a problem also with God preparing a place for us that where he is, there we may be also. So if you have a problem with the fish, you go have a problem with everything else that God has prepared. And you should have a problem too with the things God is preparing for them that love him. So it was a tailor-made fish just for Jonah. Yes. Hallelujah. So God prepared the fish. How long God took to prepare that fish? I don't know. It could be the same day. It could be thousands of years. It could be two days. Who knows? That's not the issue. The, 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 the statement is God prepared the fish. So you better learn from Jonah's story that when you are disobedient, God can prepare some things to swallow you. Mm -hmm. He can prepare a storm to swallow you. He can prepare some financial issues to swallow you. He can prepare some, some people to swallow you up. Sickness to swallow you up. He can prepare some things to swallow you. But you see, the thing is that what we don't understand is that whenever we are going through issues in life, the first thing is not to begin to blame God. That's the first thing we do. Oh God, why, why did you let this thing happen to me? Why did you let this thing? Why, 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 why? And it's always God, 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 God. What about you? Why don't you start with yourself? Why don't you cast the lot on yourself first and foremost and find out, Lord, did I in any way disobey, make a breach, open the door for something to happen to me? The reason for the storm was Jonah. The reason for the fish was Jonah. Now, here is a fun fact for you. For those of you whom God has called, is calling, and you feel like you know better than God. He's calling you to his work, but you want to achieve your worth. Hmm? Here is a fun fact for you. One fishy is out there waiting for you. Hmm? Yes, one fish is out there waiting for you. And not until you settle your disobedience issue with God will that fish spit you out. You are dealing with some things, dealing with some issues. You feel swallowed. You feel engulfed. You feel as if you are enclosed, boxed in, barred in. Before you begin to fight the devil, and to launch thunder fire at the bars that you can't break. You need to now go into the next chapter, chapter two. Now, God, the Bible says a great fish swallowed up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly. Oh my God. Yes, the inward parts, the bowels, the intestines in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights. Now let's go into chapter two. Three days and three nights. So that does not equal to Friday night until Sunday morning. No. Three days and three nights equal Monday one, Monday night one. Tuesday two, Tuesday night two. Wednesday, three. Wednesday night, three. Three days, three nights. He was in the fish belly. Now, all of this is a type and shadow of something 
greater to come, which was what? The crucifixion, the burial and resurrection of Jesus. When the men threw him overboard, when the men grabbed him, right? That's the selection of the lamb, Passover. When the men threw him overboard, that's crucifixion. When him dropped in the sea, that's burial. When he's down there in the belly, right? That's unleavened bread. And when the fish vomit him out on the land, that's resurrection. All of this is type and shadow. You might say now, but why would God choose such a thing to typify such a great work? Well, I don't know. The ways of God are past finding out. God can even use vomit. Hmm? Yes, he can even use vomit. <laughs> so be careful how you scoff up, you know, twirl up your face at the vomit. Next time you see the vomit, you begin to thank God for Jonah. All right. Chapter two of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Now, this is a very interesting concept. And I want you to see the miracles of what is going on here. If you drop in water, the longest you can stay underwater without oxygen, oxygen supply might be what? Seven minutes, if you can hold your breath that long. Brother Jojo, brother John John, eh? the, not just a brother, you know, prophet. Prophet Jojo John John Jonah was down there for three days and three nights. You check that up and you will see. How much that? 72 hours down inside there? Three days and three nights without air, without oxygen. Now, if you think that's not a miracle, now you think again. Whether or not Jonah was alive or dead is another question. But the Bible says he prayed out of the fish's belly. And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me. If you make your bed in hell, he is there. If you take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, he's there. If you go into some mountain, he's there. Where can I go from the presence of the Lord? So no matter what situation you find yourself, when you cry to God, he will hear you. I often wonder if God is hearing me when I cry, but something just tells me that God can even hear you when you don't even speak. My God. So he cried out of the belly of hell. Now, look at this now. Where was Jonah? His situation, we know he was literally in the fish's belly. Come on now, follow me. You know, we don't just look at Bible black and white. We go into the spirit of this thing. Jonah's body was in the fish's belly. But Jonah's soul was down in hell. I cried out of the belly of hell. Now, you might be looking at that and saying that, okay, Jonah is saying that inside of the fish's belly is hell. And sometimes you are... You are in some situations and you might think that, okay, this thing that I'm going through is hell. So you might say, prophet, how are you? Boy, I'm not through hell. <laughs> Your situation might seem like hell, but Jonah was in hell. At least you're alive on, this, on, the, on the face of the earth. Jonah was down under yonder, way down, down, down somewhere. Not even submarine can catch him. The technology to retrieve Jonah was not yet existent. So Jonah, the Bible says, out of the belly of hell. Now that word hell there is the word Sheol. That means the underworld. The pit, the grave, hell. That's what Sheol is translated as. So if Jonah was crying out of the fish's belly, Jonah would say, I cried out of the fish's belly. Do you know how serious it is when God appears to a man? When God 
is made known to a man and God gives an instruction to that man and that man disobeys God. Listen, your chance to make it right is non-existent if you, if you disobey. Because you have come into direct contact. You have come into direct contact with God. There is nothing beyond that, you know, friends. Absolutely nothing beyond that. You come into contact with God, and now you want to disobey this God? This is a very, very serious matter. I want you to picture those who have come in contact with God and disobey them. The time of Moses. They saw God on the mountain. They were down at the base building golden calf. Moses made one statement and the Bible said that the earth opened and swallowed them and they went down into hell alive. So I want you to picture what is going on here. Jonah could literally be down in hell, crying out to God from his soul. Let's continue. He said, and you heard my voice. Verse 3, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. So he goes back now to describing his situation in the physical. And the floods compassed me about. Remember now, where was he inside of the fish's belly? Was it a bioluminescent fish <laughs> so that he could see what was going on outside there? Because he's telling us that the floods, meaning the waters, compassed him. Floods there also could be a figurative language for the troubles. Floods mean trouble sometimes. So his troubles compassed him. The floods literally compassed him. So here is this fish. This fish might be swallowing different things and water coming in and boxing Jonah. It was a great fish, big enough to swallow a man. All thy billows and thy waves pass over me. So that liquid inside of the fish belly was dropping over Jonah, going over him, right? Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Watch this now. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. So Jonah somehow had a belief, a vision, an epiphany, if you will, of resurrection. He believed, he trusted God to forgive him, right? And take him out of this situation. Now, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. I want you to picture this. He didn't just say the bottom of a mountain. He said the bottoms of the mountains. So the man was going down and down and down and down and down. You think Challenger's Deep is deep. There was a place that Jonah went that was deeper than Challenger's Deep. The man kept going and going and going. And this fish kept going and going and going. You see, the, the, the things of God require faith for you to believe it because if you if you're going to look at this as a scientist with the knowledge that you have about fish hmm? i don't know what they call people who study fish let me give them a word fishologists if you're a fishologist eh? <laughs> and you have never <laughs> and you have never seen you know a fish a bioluminescent fish that goes deep down to the mountain and then go down to the bottom of another mountain and then the bottom of another mountain. So in other words, I'm getting an insight as to what is under the sea. There are mountains and then mountains and then mountains and then mountains. Come on now. So there are depths and depths and depths and depths. We are yet to discover what is down there. So he said the earth with her bars so the mountains now becomes the bars. So even if you could locate Jonah in some way with some kind of sub submarine tech, the fish went down a mountain, round a corner of a mountain, down another mountain, round another corner of a mountain, down a mountain, around another corner of a mountain. If you think you can find that fish, God help you. 
you can't find him. You understand? You cannot, will never find him. And it is like that sometimes for some of us that disobey God. Uh, ichthyologists, <laughs> study fishes. <laughs> I, I'll use my word, fishologists. <laughs> yes. If, if you think you can find a man that God decides to punish or rescue a man that God decides to punish, you have a next thing coming. You cannot take him out until that man makes it right with God. You can pray from now till tomorrow until that man addresses his issue of disobedience. You cannot take him out, which gives us insight now into divine judgment. Come on, this is a prelude now into divine judgment that when God finally judges men who are rebellious, disobedient, sinful, and cast them into hell. Nobody, not an angel, nobody can take out such a man. Absolutely none. Now, the Bible says that, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me. Now, do you see what is fainting now? Jonah's body is already gone. Jonah is as good as dead. So I put it to you that Jonah died. Jonah died. <laughs> Jonah died. Yes, I agree with you, Brother Howard. Jonah died. Literally, because this story is prefiguring Jesus and his resurrection. And if you know anything about the Bible in its types and shadows, in its parallels, in its figurative, literal figurative symbolisms, it is always to the T. Always. Jonah died. And guess what now is about to die? His soul so somehow God's grace was still keeping this man. But he had a time frame in which to cry out for forgiveness. I want us to understand this. That there is a time frame given to every man to fix their disobedience issue. Whether it be disobedience against God or disobedience against others, you don't have all the time in the world to fix it. There is a time frame given to you. And here is a fun fact. You don't know what that time frame is, which would make it now become all the more urgent for you to fix the issue of disobedience and rebellion. Let's finish chapter two. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. When my soul was growing weak, becoming feeble, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. That they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Take note of that. They that observe lying vanities. In other words, if you keep lying to yourself that you can fix your own problem or get away from God by being disobedient to him, you are lying to yourself and you're forsaking God's mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving I will pay that which, pay that that I have vowed. In other words, what you have asked me to do, commanded me to do, give me another chance and I will do it. Some people don't get that next chance. I want you to understand that. Salvation, watch this now. If you thought that this story had nothing to do with Jesus and salvation, here it is right before you. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord, watch this now, 
spoke unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Remember what Jesus said? He said, I lay down my life and I take it up back again. He said, this command I received of my father. In other words, the command to Jesus to resurrect was given to him long time ago. What we see in Jonah is just a typological representation of what Jesus would have done. All of this is in court. Now let's go into something tonight. Here's a question I want to ask you, and I want you to respond to me by the grace of God. Have you ever tried to escape from something you do not want to do? Have you ever tried? This, this does not necessarily have to be an instruction that God gave you, but something you have to do. Have you ever tried escaping from that? I want you to talk to me tonight. And I want you to tell me, how did that go? You have to do this thing. How did that go for you? And whether or not it was God, if it is God who gave it to you, that, that, that instruction, Please tell us it is God, right? But something you had to do. Have you ever tried escaping from it? And how did that go for you? Please raise your hands. Let's, let's talk a little bit now. I don't want you to give me an epistle, but just give me in summary what happened. Let me see if I can pick you up and uh, you can talk to us about that. Come on. All right. Pastor Diana, go ahead immediately. Please unmute. I was walking in the city, left my home, and I had only $20. And I got to a particular point, and I heard clearly, give it to this lady. A lady was coming before me. And I said, the devil is a liar. I continued walking. I rebuked that spirit, and I move on. Just before I got to my home, I saw the lady coming to me again. I heard the same instruction, give it to the lady. I said, Satan, you are her. And I said, oh God, it must be you talking. So I gave it to the lady and this lady was just elated. She was thanking God and crying and saying that she was just asking God to just send someone to give her at least $20. And this was my only $20. <laughs> Now, <laughs> between the point of you giving that $20 to this woman, what happened to you? I was troubled. My, my spirit was not, I was not settled. I was, my, I was just feeling terrible because I felt that I had acted in disobedience. My conscience would not allow me to spend it to the point that I passed the area I was supposed to have gone to spend it. I never spent it because I was just, there was this thing within my spirit that was just troubling me. My conscience wouldn't allow me to live with myself. Okay. So and after you it. gave it, what was I, the I, I was apologetic. I asked God to forgive me because I heard his voice and I ignored it. Okay. Because right. my need, I felt my need was greater. Need was greater than the than act, of, act of giving. Of, yes. Of giving. All yes. right. Now, I mean, $20 <laughs> might sound uh, not much. Not uh, much. That is about um, how much US dollars? For, let's... Not too much, just a bit. But when yeah. you don't have any at the time, it seems like a lot. Yes. And it <laughs> seems as if God uh, at times would come to us with an instruction when we are at our lowest end. Precisely. Uh, um, in... in, in um, holdings in having something or you know or you know at, at our weakest sometimes this is when god sometimes give us some of the most uh, uh arduous instructions for us to follow all right so we have a 20 dollar um example there um anyone else want to share with us what is it that you have tried to escape from 
um, that you, you know, something you did not want to do, but, you know, talk to us. I see some people saying, yes, 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 yes. Um, give us, come on. Oh. All right. I, I seem as if I need to start calling names. All right. Sister Janet, come talk to me now. What, what was that thing? Um, for me, good night, everyone. Um, it was it was a money issue. Um, I remember not working, and I was still getting paid, and I was just worshiping the Lord, and then not a voice, audible voice, but He just came in my spirit because somebody else's pay was cut. Um, give the person a certain amount, and I'm saying, but Lord. <laughs> I don't have enough. Um, I have, and I started listing out to God, you know, like I'm saying, no, it's not my mind. So I started listing out to God all the responsibilities I had and all the things I had to cover. And I just started laughing and I say, you know what, Lord? Uh, and then right after that, a message, somebody was preaching and I just turned on, I went on YouTube and I said, let me listen to this message. And it was the same thing that was being spoken about or taught about how God will tell you what to do and who to give and whatever. And then I say, you know what, Lord, let me just give this lady um, what you, and at the exact amount that came to mind, and it's like, you know, I was really struggling and I did. And this person said, you know, Miss Howard, <laughs> I didn't want to tell you. And she started telling me all that was happening with her. So at first I was hesitating and arguing with God. And then I just did it. And um, was your conscience troubled um, when you had refused to do so? Yes, I felt uncomfortable until I, I just started smiling and saying, you know what, God? Yeah, when I heard that message, it was like that was a confirmation. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sister Shamara, let's hear from you. Good night, everyone. Night. Sir, pardon me, not... um showing my video that's all right go ahead um it was one day i went over to I, I went over the gct department some find out to some find out about some tax business and then i had only 500 dollars you know i mean i have no money it's just a 500 dollars for my lunch and what I, I i was driving around because i couldn't find a parking spot and I saw the security and the Lord said I should give her the 500. So God, you know, I'm going to her the $500 for my lunch. And you know, I proceeded to drive out. And my, conscience, my conscience struck me. And I turned back. And I couldn't, when, when I look, it's three flights. I said, Mr. God, on top, I turn back. Because me decided to I'll give her the 500. I forgot to climb three flights of stairs. Go give her. When I look, she was coming down. And down the stairs, and then a parking space was there. Remember, I went there and there was no parking. I just come out of the car and just gave her the five hundred dollars. And she said, "You know, Miss Gilbert, I never have no feet and hunger I kill me." And I went back in the car and I said, "Lord, I won't disobey you again. If you ask me to do something, or you tell no matter how large the amount is or how small, I will do it." Now. What happened to you in between giving that? I just say, all right, me go dead for hungry then, so let me give her. Okay. See, I'm, I'm not pretty in it up, sir. Okay. So and I when, gave her, and I didn't die for hungry the day I got lunch. Got lunch, okay. All right, so God provided for you. Yes, he did. Um, after you obeyed. All right, great. All right, Samantha, let, let me hear from you. Yes. Yeah. Good night, everyone. So right now I'm in the um, I'm in that situation. So um, I, I go around to nursing home and I cut the senior citizens hair, not only cut however they want it, I cut our style however they want it. And now the holidays is coming up is next week. This one lady that I've been I've been going to all her nurses home. She has like four of them. It's been for a while, years that I've been going there. And um, I do these uh, senior or sick people's hair. 
And I just charge them like $10 really for my gas because I have to drive around my lunch and then to sharpen back my scissors and my clippers. So two weeks ago, she texts me, the lady uh, texts me, um, the residents need a haircut. When can you come? When are you coming? So I told her I would come that uh, the next day. But then when I looked, I realized I didn't bring home my, my tools to go and, and do the work. So I texted her back and I said, well, you know, I, um, I'm not going to be able to come tomorrow because I didn't bring home my tools. So next week, well, next week is now. And I brought home my tools, but I just didn't feel like going. I've been feeling tired. So lo and behold, I got a phone call today. One of the resident's daughter called me. Hello, my name is such and such. I got your, your number from Miss Jane. That's the lady who owned the nursing home. And you know, next week is Thanksgiving and I want my mom's hair done. And, and she just go on and on. And then I felt guilty because I know I'm supposed to go this week and tomorrow I'm going back to work and I was off the, the last few days. And now I feel so guilty and I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I'm just, I'm going to go. I tell the lady, I'm go. I'm coming on Sunday. I'm going to start at one house first. I ask her which house her mother is at, uh, which nursing home her mother is at. And she told me, well, I said, I'll go that, that one second since she's going to church. She told me she's going to church and she really wants to be there when I'm doing her mom's hair. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm just tired. So I'm not really trying to get out of it I'm, I've been really tired and I, 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 I do it because I love it I want to do it but I'm just I've just been tired so, and I feel guilty now so but I'm going next week I'm going Sunday you see listening to all of you that have spoken so far one word is common amongst you all guilt 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 and we can begin to learn something about disobedience immediately. We, we have not yet gone into this, you know. Disobedience produces guilt. Guilt eats you out. It tears you apart. And, and, and we need to understand that. That whenever you feel in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your conscience, in your soul, that you are being ripped apart, it could be that guilt is in operation and if guilt is in operation then there is a root of disobedience somewhere and until you deal with that you see the thing about disobedience is this you cannot just repent and leave it alone you have to do what you are supposed to do you have to do it you don't you don't get a a free card off no repentance follows action or action follows repentance so you have to do what you were supposed to do initially and the thing is that sometimes we don't understand that the instruction of god is not going to come with an audible voice very seldom very few people will hear the audible voice of god as i'm talking to you now very few but God speaks to us in so many different ways, hopefully by God's grace. Next year, we're going to be looking at some of these things in depth. God speaks to you through your conscience, your heart, your mind, through the word, through so many different ways, an impression, an inspiration. Um, you're seeing somebody and you get a premonition. You know, so many different ways God speaks. And we need to come out of this realm that is... Is my voice or my head talking to me? <laughs> no. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And God will not tell you to do something evil. And chances are, if it is a good action, then it is God who is behind it. If it is something good that you ought to do, especially giving, then God is behind it. And usually, you know, I don't know why we fight the whole matter of giving, you know, it, it's as if it's in our nature. This self-preservation nature inside of us prevents us from reaching out quickly to helping others. And I think this is where we miss it a lot of times and miss our window of opportunity 
to be blessed by God. Because when you delay something, when you delay an, an act of obedience, you're also delaying your own prosperity, blessing, deliverance, release. And this is a real thing. This is a real thing. Let me ask Sister Kendian. Sister Kendian, go ahead, please. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. So yes, man of God. So it was like a couple of years ago, I was given an instruction to send a particular message to a group which I was part of. And okay, my on, spirit on, was... On. This, this one, no, I'm, I'm very interested in this one. <laughs> so you got a prophetic message. No, not a prophetic message. I was given a message from an individual. Oh, okay, from an who individual. Who was in charge. Okay. Yes, part of a group. Was, okay, right? who was in charge. Yes. Still interested and in it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy with the message because to me, it's... I, don't, I didn't think it was the way forward. My spirit wasn't in agreement to send the message. So I phoned the individual and I tried speaking to them to say, okay, I think we should change it up a bit because even though people are acting a certain way, you do not take the same step or the same approach as them. You need to go humble. However, I was still you know, encouraged. The person was adamant that I should send the message. And um, I was like, God, you know me, this is not me, you know my heart. Um, but anyways, because obviously it, the person was over me and I was under them, I, I you know, pursued anyway, sending the message. And my God, hell break loose. Everything that you could think of went wrong. I was called names, I was reported, it didn't end there, it, you know, it just went on and on and on. I never had any peace. And even though the individual that had given me the message, um, you know, stepped in to say, you know, it wasn't, you know, the message didn't come, even though Sister Kendall sent the message, the message, you know, was from me. It was a direct order given. No, no one believes that individual. So all the blame came on me. And from since that time, I have learned my lesson that whenever I hear that still voice say no, I hear no. When I hear that still voice says, go ahead, I go ahead. And, you know, I, I was so, I could have relate with what you was asking, you know, so that's why I've asked to share. Um, I, I have never, never forgotten even now I'm sharing it with you, I can feel, you know, that feeling, you know, it was a really, really, really um, dramatic um, experience, you, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So you came under fire for the message you delivered. So yes, let me understand. So the leader gave you a message to deliver. You didn't want to deliver it in the way that it was given. You wanted to temper it because you were hearing the voice of the Lord saying, don't deliver it this way. Yes, don't do it that so, way. Right. And so you disobeyed God's voice, obeyed yes. the leader's voice, yes. and then all hell broke loose on you. Yep. Okay. Everything came down on me. Was it ever mended? I, I don't think so. It never you know, even the, the attitude towards me had never changed. It was just getting worse. It was just reports upon reports about me to different leaders of the church. Um, you know, I've been starting to judge. Um, I was being judged. Okay. All um, right. So it, yeah, it just... It just went never, down from there. All yeah, right, it now. just, yeah. Now, here is, I, I didn't want to get into this yet, but this is something that we're going to get into. You know, the whole matter of what do I do when I come in conflict with my leader and God? <laughs> this, this is a serious issue. What do I do when I am in conflict caught between my leader and God? Give me a second, Angelita. Let me tell you a story. The life of a prophet is not an easy life. 
if you're a true prophet, any at all, at some point in time, you will get a message to deliver that could bring you into, um, uh, how would I put it, into disfavor with men. And if you don't deliver it, it will bring you into disfavor with God. It's like you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Don't ever think that the prophets of the Bible had it easy because the messages they had to deliver many times got their heads chopped off. You read the book of Hebrews, the hall of faith and the hall of fame. You will see that the Bible said they got their heads chopped off. Some were sawn asunder, some were killed. <laughs> Why? Because of the messages that they delivered. The messages weren't good. You remember one prophet, one king, said, oh, I don't like that prophet. He don't have nothing good to say to me. He has never had anything good to say about me. I don't want to hear anything that he has to say. That's the king saying that, you know. The king. Now, true story. I had a message to deliver. God gave me a message to deliver um, some time ago. I wrote down the message word for word. Word for word. And I sat on the message for three months, man was I troubled. Man was it eating me out. Why was it eating me out? If, if, I, if that message was to give to Pastor Diana, I would call Pastor Diana and say, Diana, thus say the Lord without even flinching. You know why? Because Diana couldn't do me nothing. She couldn't beat me. She couldn't kill me. She couldn't remove nothing from me. She couldn't make my life any harder or any difficult. In other words, Diana had no power over me. So it's easier to deliver a message to a man who has no power over you. Come on now. Now, what happens when you have to deliver a message to a man who has power over you, who can fire you, who can make your life miserable, who can make one phone call and everybody start seeing you like a demon? What do you do then? When the message you have to deliver is to that level. And so I had this message to deliver. And one day, the Lord spoke to me and said, if you don't deliver the message, I kill you. Plain, plain. Plain as day. He said, I kill you. You said, prophet, Lord said, mm -hmm. So now I was trembling now because... If I deliver the message, guess what? I did. If I don't deliver the message, I did. So <laughs> anyway, you take it, whether I deliver or I don't deliver, I did. So guess what? I have to now choose my dead. I have to choose which dead am I going to, to receive? Which dead am I going to accept? Which death am I going to take? And I say, well, it's better to fall into the hand of God. So if the man kill me, God can resurrect me. Well, sure to know. I, 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 got, I got stabbed there. Eh? Head chopped off, everything. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm with you today, because God resurrected me. <laughs> you understand? So thank God I chose my dead. <laughs> I chose the right dead. You see, there are times when you have to make the decision between man and God and at all times, choose God. Choose God. No matter how it's going to turn out, choose God. Because you might not see a way out of it, but we know a God who can command a fish to vomit a man where he's supposed to be. Hmm? Come on now, we know, we know that God was able to make a way where there seems to be no way. Disobedience is a serious matter. We're going to talk about this, you know, we're getting into this. Sister Angelita, I'll take your uh, comment and then I'll move on. Good night, Prophet. Good night, everyone. Good night. Um, this, this topic is actually... Uh, <laughs> something that I've been dealing with for a while. But in any case, in the sale of my home, um, last year, uh, the home was sold. 
But prior to that, it was, it, it actually took me 10 years to let go off of that home. And I remember my daughter was actually four, five years old the first time um, the Lord spoke through her. And I kept delaying, 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 delaying the sale of the home. One, because if I put the home on the market, I don't know where I was going to go. I wanted to see where I was going to go before I did that. And I remember um, about the ending of, of uh, 2019 going into 2020, I remember a sister called me and her and I were praying. And in that prayer, I, I, I knew the Lord was speaking at that point, that it was time to let go. It's time, it's time to move. And I kept delaying, delaying, delaying. And the final warning I got was, if you don't move, you're going to regret the consequences. But on top of that, I kept seeing little things that were happening. My, my, my last daughter, for example, she was getting hurt. As she moved in the house, she dropped, she hit her head. So things were starting to get really out of place. And I remember one day going back into prayer and I said, but God, if I don't know where I'm going, how can I sell the house? It's not just me, it's the entire family. Where am I supposed to go? And I remember um, the Lord saying to me, how can I show you where you need to go when you have not done the last thing I told you to do? And in that whole process, I remember the last warning I got about getting out of that house. Um, I remember not being able to sleep comfortably because I wasn't sure if I was going to wake up um, because of my disobedience. And the, the, the bottom line is delayed obedience is still disobedience was the end. Um, the, the, the thing I walked away from with that, it doesn't matter how long it takes me to do it. It's still disobedience, even though I'm delaying the process of what God told me to do. So I just wanted to share that. Yes. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And, um, we, I, I like, I like that statement. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Now, how would we define disobedience? Let's give a definition disobedience is the rebellion against recognized authority disobedience is the rebellion against recognized and let me put in another word legitimate authority recognized and legitimate authority it is a failure to obey it is total disregard or contempt for god and for Christ. It is basically doing what God told you not to do. So let's, let's get into this whole matter now. We read the story of Jonah, just a part of it. There are other aspects to this that, um, we, you know, Jonah's anger and all of that kind of stuff, but let's deal with his disobedience first and foremost. Rebellion against legitimate and recognized authority. Who is it that establishes authority in the earth realm it is god god is the one who establishes authority god is the one who establishes systems and he has certain structures and orders in play now let's deal with the church first and foremost because a lot of us when we become comfortable in christendom in christianity and we begin to uh, get more information and more informed and become more enlightened, I also recognize that we begin to get more arrogant. Arrogance seems to begin to fill the hearts of individuals as they become more informed and more enlightened. And we wonder why, why do people do this? Because you are hearing statements these days like, uh, everybody is equal, all, all offices are equal, or ta all titles are equal, and all of that. No, 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 no. We are equal in Christ. We are equal at the blood. But when it comes onto God's system of order, there are some things that are present. 
first apostles, secondarily prophets, and there are some ranks and orders, not ranks and orders to bring subjugation, but for responsibility. So if we don't understand this, then we begin to, 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 to push things in a direction they ought not to go. However, if we don't understand authority, legitimate and recognized, then we will begin to behave in disobedience and in rebellion. Come on, we need to, we need to understand this. We need to understand this. Now, when we come into the church, for argument's sake, because our nature is not to follow order, we will rebel against anything that seems like order. And the moment an individual, a leader, begins to exhibit authority, you will find people who will rebel against it easily. Now, the question I want to ask some of you is this, and I know your hands are going to fly up in the air. Seriously. Let's put some facts on the table. God has established order in the church. There is a recognized pattern of authority in the church. Hands down, fact. Any church without order is not the church of Jesus Christ. There has to be order for things to flow properly and correctly. Number two fact that we want to look at. The offices of Jesus Christ does delineate, delineate a system and a structure of authority. How do we then recognize what is legitimate from what is not. Number one, no man can get up and say of himself that he is self-appointed. No man is self-appointed, none. Jesus, the Messiah, when he went down into the water to be baptized of John, and he came out, a voice came from heaven, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The voice came from heaven and recognized Jesus' legitimate authority as the son of God. It happened twice. Twice that happened. God established and recognized Jesus' authority as the Messiah. Jesus appointed apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. He appoints them. But what we realize is that no man is self-appointed. That's the first thing. So if I'm going to recognize a legitimate authority, it cannot be that that authority is self-appointed. Who recognizes you? Do the people you lead recognize you to be such? Do others out there recognize you to be such? And as the voice of God spoken through others who are not connected to you, any at all who recognize you to be such? That's the question. Within the mouth of two or three, a thing is established, a thing is confirmed. One, the people that you serve, do they recognize you? Two, people outside, 
do they recognize you? Three, God, does he recognize you? Those are the three strands that you can look at to say that, okay, this authority is legitimate authority. And we're not talking about Bandulu people. We are talking about legitimate, recognized people whose grace, whose history, whose anointing can be traced. They have a history. It can be traced. I'm not talking about going to some um, degree shop and buying your certification that you're a pastor. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about you going to another land to be ordained as a bishop when the people in your land do not recognize you as such. No, no, no. That, that cannot be legitimate in your sphere. The people in your sphere have to recognize you. And if, if, if somebody outside is going to come and do it, then let them come to your land to do it. Because I know God can send people to do certain things. But we're talking about legitimacy. So that the authority can be recognized. And why is it important that, that legitimacy, why is legitimacy important? Because when you speak, when you give an instruction, it must come with the power of the office that you hold. Now, in the church, there are so many things going on. I heard the, the testimony of Apostle John. When I first met him, I was listening for his testimony. And when I began to speak to him, the Lord said, he is an apostle. And you listen to uh, uh, Apostle's testimony, he said, the bishops of Asia consecrated him, inducted him into the, the office of the apostleship. And he said he never used it. Not that he did not recognize these men. He had great honor for these men. But he said, God, please, lest I become puffed up, send a confirmation of this that I have received. And the first thing I said to him as a prophet was, man of God, you are an apostle without knowing anything about him and about what transpired behind the scenes. And then he was now comfortable to now step into the office freely in spirit and in mind. Because that third strand that strand that is outside, who has no connection to him, he has been waiting on that. But some of us are not so humble to wait on God to legitimately recognize your elevation. I know what some of you have been saying to me concerning my calling. And I said, okay, keep quiet. Why? Because I am waiting on what? Certain other dimensions of the recognition so that the, the, the elevation can become legitimate. Now, here is the question that I have for you. Do you think our leaders are insensitive to our views and our opinions? <laughs> I'm twisting this thing up tonight. Do you think our leaders are insensitive to our views and our opinions? You might not be a pastor. You might be a pastor under a pastor. You might not be the, 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 the final stop of your ministry. So you might just be a member in a church. Do you think our leaders are insensitive to our views and our opinions? And here's why I'm asking that. Because you heard what Kendian said. Her leader 
instructed her to do something. But God was speaking to her in her spirit not to do it that way. But the leader would not listen to her and the end product is trouble. I want you to talk to me. Do you think they are insensitive? And what do you think could make them to become so insensitive? Because here's, here's, here's where this is going. When you refuse to carry out an instruction that a leader gives, it does not matter whether or not you are hearing from God or it is your contrived opinion based on your expertise or wisdom, the leader will see it as rebellion, insubordination, and disobedience. The only way the leader will not see it as that is if that leader is humble enough to trust the voice of the Holy Spirit in you and to have a dialogue with you concerning what you are saying. Please talk to me. Let's hear from you. Do you think our leaders are insensitive to our views and opinions? And why would you say so? Don't be afraid to talk to me. Come on, this is a, this is a safe place for you to talk. Hands up, let's go. Come on, talk to me. Sister Janet, go ahead. Um, I believe that some of our leaders are insensitive to our views and opinions. And the, my reason for saying that is after a while, um, not forgetting that some of them were not called. Some of them, as you said, they're self-appointed or it's a family tradition and the post was handed down to other family members because, you know, they have forgotten the part where Jesus prayed about his disciples in selecting them. But, and I know the main reason is pride. It's like at first they were spiritual, they were listening to God. But after a while, who are you to talk to me? Who are you to question what I say? Even though sometimes the members or um, subordinates, they are respectful, but they just cannot see beyond the person asking them the question and where the person is they think they are and I, I really think the root of it is pride so they have stopped listening to god and it's about pride who are you to tell me this um you say you hear from god and i've, I've heard and seen where persons who are really hearing i mean based on their track record they're shut down and it goes back to pride pride wow. all the members can be very, you know, it, it's pride on their part. Who are you not to listen to me? But yes. in general, in general, I won't blame the leaders alone, but in general, the leaders have become, they have shut down, um, they have shut off the voice of the people because it's the, they're hearing themselves more than anything else or even God. But it's all about their voice. Okay. All right. That's, that's a very interesting interesting point right there leaders have shut down the voice of others and by so doing they have also shut out the counsel of god through others and that's and that's one of the things that i have um noticed um of late that you find that there is this mentality in leaders i'm not saying all some leaders where we think that the elevation to an office automatically makes us to become elite, automatically makes us to become more than others that we lead. And um, this, this is a wrong mindset because if, if we continue with that mindset as leaders, we will miss out on the grace that God has given to others. Some people might not have an, an office or a title, but they are heavily anointed by God, heavily anointed by him. And then there are those who feel as if, because they are exhibiting some gifts that the leader might not have, they now think that they are more than the leader, which now, 
brings to issue or to the to 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 the to the fore the issue of pride in both leadership and those who are being led that elevation to an office does not make you to become elite the reception of a gift of the spirit or the demonstration or manifestation of it does not make you to become elite or better than anyone but you are given that so that you can become servants of one another and so insensitivity can result because leaders sometimes do not value the views and opinions of others they don't want to listen to what others have to say and where did this creep in from in the church where did this come from and that's that's another aspect of of um, you know, research we have to look at. Where did this come from? Please talk to me. Some of you have experienced some things out there in churches. Um, you have gone through some stuff. Please don't be afraid to talk to me. Do you think some leaders are insensitive to your views and your opinions? Have you encountered that where your leader might say something and then you might have a different view and you're you're trying to get them to see that view and it is seen as something else. Have you encountered that? And how did you deal with that? Please talk to me. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. Okay. Can I ask, um, what if it is a situation where you don't even have any view. You are not permitted to, to voice anything because you are considered to be um, insubordinate if you don't, if you, you say anything or your views does not, do not matter because uh, you are not the one who hears from God and you are incapable of hearing from God because this is not who you are called to be. And God only speaks to the leader and not you, the follower, remain in your lane. That's just a question I need to ask. My God. <laughs> now this opens a whole different can of worms right here. Yes, let the birds now come and devour. God doesn't speak to you. You're not the leader. You're not the one God has given this church, this vision to I am. So you, your opinion does not count. It is not valued. I don't want to hear what you have to say. Well, immediately we know something that that is against the spirit of church gathering. When you come together, Paul says, let each one of you bring a psalm, bring a hymn, bring a word, bring an encouragement. If, oh my God, to help me Jesus. If you are in a place where you cannot speak, I'm not talking about you being controversial, that you always have to be contradictory, critical, and controversial. No, no, no. You know, there are some people like that, always fault finding, but never have solution. Yes, I'm not talking about those people need to shut up. But if you are in a place where you cannot speak, where the spirit of God in you is not trusted, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I am not the only one that carries the spirit of the Lord. I'm not the only one who is gifted. I'm not the only one who is anointed. There are some of you, you are more anointed than I am. You have more gifts than I do. I'm still trying. I'm still praying to be anointed like you. But if you're in a place where your voice cannot and has no place to be heard, chances are you're in a cult. 
And if it is not a cult yet, chances are you're dealing with a cult spirit in that leader. And if it does not reach a cult spirit yet, then maybe you are dealing with Jezebel inside of that leader. But we're going to be bold and blunt tonight in what we are saying. Because the church, the gathering of believers, when we gather together, the Bible says that each one, one must come with a song, one must come with a word. One must come with an encouragement. One must come with a prophecy. Whatever God has given to you, come with it. Do you realize, saints of God, that we have turned church into a lecture hall where we have a speaker and the speaker comes and speak what he wants to speak. And then after he has finished speaking, nobody else must speak. The speaker has already spoken the word of the Lord. That's it. But what happens to the Holy Spirit's instruction to us concerning our gathering together? Because I might be having, let me say a premonition about something as a leader. I might be feeling something in my spirit that, hey, look, something is off right here. I can't put my finger on it yet as to what is going on, but I can feel it. But then the fullness of the revelation is given to somebody else. And so I might just say it, but I don't allow anybody else to speak. So I don't get the next piece of the information down there. Why is it that the Holy Spirit does this? Because... He does not want any man to think that they are the elite. That they are the God of the church. We are a body. We are a body. When the finger, if you cut your finger, for argument's sake, and it bleeds, and you have that wound, where does the white blood cells come from? To bring healing to that wound. Huh? It has to come from somewhere else in the body. To reach that finger. It has to come from somewhere. It has to be manufactured somewhere else. The white blood cells are not manufactured in your finger. It's manufactured somewhere else in your body. And transported to your finger. Through the, to the, the vein system. So you might be going through an issue right here, but you don't have the solution. It's manufactured by the Holy Spirit and sent through a different channel in the body. You see, insensitivity, whether in leadership or in followership, can amount to misconstrued ideas of disobedience, rebellion, and insubordination because one's opinion or one's revelation from the Holy Spirit is not given the chance to be heard. And so whether you're a leader or whether you're a follower, whether you're gifted or not gifted, one of the first things that you must get rid of is insensitivity. You have to get rid of that spirit because if you don't get rid of that spirit, you will end up like Jonah. Jonah had no concern no feelings, follow me now, for the people of Nineveh. In fact, Jonah would rather the people of Nineveh die. Because he knew that if he went with that message that God gave him, 
there is a 99% chance that God could forgive them if they repent. I leave the 1% to say if they don't. But if they repent, God is going to have mercy on them. Jonah was insensitive to the people's sinful condition. And you cannot be insensitive. The moment that kind of attitude is inside of you, it is going to become very easy for disobedience to become a part of your repertoire. Now, here's my next question. What would you do if you were asked to take a message to your enemy that would eventually save them? Come now, all of you backfiring prayer warriors, come talk to me. Mm -hmm. You can't keep quiet now. I'm going to call them out if you don't keep quiet at this one. What would you do if you were given a message to take to your enemy that would save your enemy? Mm -hmm. Yes, boy. Ah, boy. Come now, come now, come now. Talk to me. Yes, Samantha. Mm -hmm. I would tell them. <laughs> you would tell them. You, you're, yes. you're just going to tell them just like that. It's just going to be so easy for you to tell them. Hmm? Just like it's going to come out. It's going to come out. Yes. Yeah. I ain't telling you that it's going to be easy for me. So let me put it on the table. It will not be easy for me. You okay. understand? So, so me, I, 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 I become transparent before you. I said my enemy. Hmm? The easiest thing to do with my enemy is thunder fire. Eh? Yes? Lightning strike. Split you in two. Deliver what? Eh? We have some Jonah type intercessors around here. Eh -eh. You Jonah intercessors, I calling you forth. You Jonah prayer warriors, come forth now. Sister Kathleen, let me hear from you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Prophet. Good evening. And everyone. Prophet B, this would be one of the hardest things to do. Mm. I remember even when God was working on me and he sent me to someone that did me something so terrible and tell me, you go and ask them for forgiveness. And I was like, I wrestled with God so much. I was like, no, this person did that to me. Why should I be the one to go and ask them for forgiveness? And God kept telling me over, so much less for me to go to an enemy. I mean, eventually we know that, and we speak of the love, but uh, the love of Christ and everything, and we ought to show love and love should be the base, but saying it and doing it is two different, it's too different you know, things. and yes, and this, is, this would be very hard, but eventually I guess I would have to, but it would be very hard. You see, th th this, this, is, this is a real, real thing, real, real thing. What would you do if you were asked to take a message to your enemy that would eventually save them? This is a serious thing. I'm going somewhere with this. Sister Livet, um, I saw your hand up. Good night, Prophet. Good, Good night. night. I would have struggled with it first because... Mm -hmm. And it depends on the on the message that you're carrying. The person, the enemy might think is get you want to get to them. But I would really struggle with it in order to carry the message. But maybe I would I would still do it. But I would struggle at first. You would struggle at first, but you would eventually do it. Yes. Why would you do that? That's your enemy. Um because if you're following the guidelines of what God say we are to do, we, you must love your enemy and those who do bad to you, you still do good to them. If you follow in that guideline, you would still do it. You would do it. Okay. So if and if it's a matter of a fact, you know, to really go to someone that has done something really bad to me, mm -hmm. I can it easily now i can do it very easily now because um when you were at a younger stage in your life there were certain things you said who me me not deal with she but no you look at it differently there's the maturity comes with life okay. 
maturity comes with life. Yeah, as you grow older and get more mature, you see things. Okay, maturity comes with life. All right, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting um, statement right there. Maturity comes with life. Sister Shante Rose, wow. Go ahead, my dear. Mm -hmm. Prophet, good night. I'm sorry, you know, but. Yes. God, we're not always going to do but we're not doing it. <laughs> We're not so mature yet. I'm not doing it. My enemy? Uh-uh. <laughs> I have to have the Jonah experience, but I'm uh, sorry. I'm not doing it. I love this. I love this. I love this. I love this. Here is blunt, straight-up, bold honesty. Yes, Shante, you are speaking for those who are hiding behind the shadows here tonight because a lot of us would not do it. That's just the truth. A lot of us would not do it. And that's the plain truth. Eh? That's the plain truth. A lot of us would not do it. I want, to, I want to play something for you. I want you to um, listen to this. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. All right, now, please listen to this. Everybody, once again, greetings from the channel Restoration Ministries Asia. This morning we received a video recently viraled everywhere. I just took importance to share this video in my channel to appreciate the pastor who stand and who prove the Christ-like man of God. I'm very honored to thank the pastor for the obedience of the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Before we go through the uh, honoring words, let us observe uh, let's see the words in the video how the man of God accepted joyfully the persecution. Let's see. <laughs> सेक्टर <laughs> 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 हाँ सेक्टर में नहीं आना बात खत्म समझ में आया सभी को बता रही हूँ कहीं भी दिखेंगे खुला छूटा मेरे तरफ से तबीयत से ठोक लेना महिलाओं पुरुषों कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता अगर हिंदुत्व को दांव में लगाने आए हो तो मारने के बाद मेरे को बुला लेना समझ में आया पकड़ो इसको चलो खा ले अरे ये भी उड़ीसा से कांटा मांझी अरे चुपड़ा रहते हैं लोग तेरे जैसा खटिया है देखो ग्रुप में कहाँ पर रहते हैं फुल एड्रेस लिखना हम लोगों को चाहिए सारा सारा थाना में चलो जहाँ जा रहे थे सारा खाना खाने का लोग चलो बचाते मुंह बचाते मुंह तो मैं हू� it is really very much honorable to see the Christ likeness on this man of God. As it is written in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. This is a great reward, my loving brothers and sisters, 
whose tooth over there that your reward is glad hallelujah i would like to remind you of the believer and now fellow i will permit uh pastor john apostle john if you could tell us what was happening behind the scenes there what was the lady saying to the pastor that moved her to slap him in the face what was going on oh actually glory to god uh, i never expected and i never believed I that <laughs> men, men of god will do this and today actually i'm very much peaceless with the teaching that i found this is uh, a part that i never want to re remember in my life at the life of yona the life of yona is one of the a great example in my life that i was once uh, struggling and i am the one who have uh, really overcome with the great storms that the lord has sent to yona similar to me so i don't want to go through it once again so actually what happened is that uh, in the month of september last week this is uh, this video is about the september last, last week there was two coincident uh, um, took place uh, uh, with my teams uh, in some different places. Uh, this is uh, this incident. This video actually took place in uh, Orissa. Uh, it is in the southern part of India. Uh, this uh, the team was going for uh, distributing the word of God. Uh, that we uh, that we are here. Uh, we, we took on the type of ministry that is uh, the booklets, uh, the booklets and. Uh, uh, the tracks, that means the words of God, so the scriptures, uh, the print, the printed scriptures are distributed door to door. And we used to get a, a certain opportunity to share the word of God to doors to doors. So this is a team of young boys and girls leading by this pastor, uh, moving to share the word of God in a, in a sector that is one of the uh, area where all the officials are staying over there and suddenly this uh, crowd they came and they stopped them and they opposed not to come there and they opposed not to see the word of God why what the woman was saying is that who the hell you were to preach the gospel upon the Hindus who the hell you were to preach the gospel upon the Hindus we don't bother whether there is police. Yeah, police were also standing over there. We don't bother whether police or whether officials are there. We will, we will beat you if we found you sharing the gospel, preaching the gospel. If you come back again, then, then this is also the warning that she's saying to everyone. If you find these people anymore in this area, whatever you want to do, if you want to beat, you beat them. You want to kill, kill them. I will be the responsibility. So in the probably they're opposing the word of God, and he she slept in front of them, not only to that boy, uh, to that pastor, also to other pastors. The the two coincident places was taken out, and uh, one video is there. I was put on the uh, very strictly ordered not to uh, share it to anybody by the government and by the police. That is uh, taken place with my pastor and with my worker. That uh, that is strictly warned me not to share that video to anybody else. Uh, that was because some injury took place. One of my teacher who is teaching the children uh, was injured in the eardrum and bleeding was occurred, and we we admitted in the hospital. And the lady who prepared the food for the children were uh, was fractured the hand, and I was supposed to upload a video for that, but let on the. Um, investigation team strictly warn us not to share that video because it will be one of the great problem even to the society. So this is the thing sexually we sometimes this is not a great persecution but the, the things that we are going uh, through with certain um, struggles while reaching the gospel. Wow, wow. Wow, thank you Apostle for sharing that with us. My God, what will you do if you were told to take a message to your enemy that could save them? And, and this is exactly what Jonah was asked to do. 
to carry a message to Nineveh. Please remember, Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was the country that invaded Israel and took 10 tribes into the dispersion. So Jonah had no, no feelings for the Ninevites, none whatsoever. And now here is in our real time lifetime, it might not be happening in our land, but here is the apostle before us who is living this. And he can't stop preaching the gospel. He has to continue preaching the gospel, carrying the gospel to these people so that they can experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so there are times when you might be asked by God to carry a message to go and give to your enemies, people who could possibly kill you, people who could possibly destroy you, and you have to carry that message. This, this is not something that is just uh, on printed paper. This is something that a man before us has to be living that right now. So it will, it will beg the question uh, for some of us right now, is there a limit to obedience? Is there a limit to obedience? Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line with God? Where do you draw the line with men? Where do you draw the line? Is there a line? Do you draw a line? Is there a limit to obedience? Come on, talk to me. Is there a limit? Come on, what, what if you were that pastor that a woman slapped? And um, you have to understand even in the, the Indian culture, a woman is not supposed to hit a man. That's, that's, that's disgraceful. That's, that's, that's a disgrace. That's a shame on that man. That man would be considered a shame in, in the society. So it, it's, it's like double shame the man is going under. First and foremost, he's a Christian. He's considered to be an outcast immediately. And then a woman is slapping him. That, that's another um, shame on top of shame right there. Do you draw the limit? Do you have a line? Please talk to me. Do you have a line when it comes on to obedience? Don't just tell me there is no limit and there is no line. Shante said she's she not going. She, she have to go in the belly of the fish like Jonah before she goes. That's, that's, that's plain outright honesty right there. You understand? Some of you, you feel the same way like Shante, but you're afraid to say it. I'm not here to judge you. We just want to talk. You understand? We just want to talk. Do you think there's a limit to obedience? And what is that limit? Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. What if your pastor told you take the knife and slash her throat? Is there a limit to obedience? Come on, talk to me. Hmm. Where are my people? Here I am, prophet. <laughs> Seem as if that video shaked up some of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, prophet, I would say that to God, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Yes. And for God, you the ultimately you need to, you just have no choice but to obey. Mm -hmm. But with man, I believe there is a limit. Because man cannot take the place of God. And so there are times when you have to draw the line with the man. But with God, there is no line that can be drawn because God ultimately has the way. He has, yes. he has the final say. All right. Yes. And, and, and in, uh, in adding to that, let's, let's put some things forward. Because God sometimes asks us to do some things that are very bizarre. For instance, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and take him to the mountain and sacrifice him there. Eh? <laughs> now, if I was Abraham, eh? if I was Abraham, I would go into 40 days of fasting, then 72 days, then 120 days until I hear something else. 
And when you come out of that, the, the, the instruction would still be, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and take him to the mountain and sacrifice him there. You see, <laughs> this God is something else. We know that God is not into human sacrifice, but God was testing something else in Abraham so that God could open the gate for his son to come to be sacrificed. We, we, we know that story because we have the full picture. You know, we can see the full picture. But when God gives you an instruction, you don't have the full picture. You have only what he tells you. And sometimes it is hard. Go and deliver the message. If you don't deliver it, I kill you. <laughs> then whose hand would you rather fall? That's the question. Who would you rather fall? You understand? So here we are now. Um, the gospel. The Lord says, go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's the instruction. Some will die in preaching it. Some will be persecuted and live in preaching it. Some will not be persecuted in preaching it. You don't know what's going to happen to you. And you can't say you are not going because this might happen or that might happen or this could or this could be. No, you just have to just pick up yourself and go. This is why it is important that whatever you're doing, it must be that it is God who sends you. As long as he sends you, then whatever the outcome, it is going to be good. It's going to be glorious. Look at Peter and John. They were beaten and commanded not to preach the gospel. And they stood up and they said, well, after they finished getting beaten, they said, we count it all joy. And they go and preach the gospel again, knowing that they could get killed this time. They didn't care. They said, who would we rather obey? You are God. And they said, we would rather to obey God. Here is the thing. Many of us have not come into an a true encounter with Jesus. If you come into a true encounter with Jesus, where you're truly convicted, truly converted, then obeying him is not going to be an issue. When your obedience to Jesus comes under question, you must begin to question whether or not you encountered him. And, and this is a real true statement. You can't say this is what I will do or this is what I will not do. It is rather you say, if I am faced with this, may God give me the grace to make the right decision. Because you don't know. When you are faced with life and death, brethren, <laughs> the, the, the natural instinct inside of us is to preserve life. And some of you, if it was you, that, that box, I heard that box, you know, that box the man got echoed. Eh? Plakow! I felt it. And the man turned the other cheek and said, put another one here. I said, me, turn which other cheek. Eh? I wouldn't remember the other cheek part, Apostle. I would say, Krataka setarakatai, thunder fire. Eh? <laughs> I wouldn't turn the other cheek at all. Eh? At least not in this seat that I'm sitting right now. I don't know what I would do if I got the box. But, you know, sitting here and looking at the box, I wouldn't like that, that, that turning cheek business there. I don't know about that one. There are some hard pills to swallow in the Bible. Eh? Jesus made some hard statements, hard pills to swallow, very hard pills. One day I was reading the Bible and I came across something that Jesus said. And I say, ah, Jesus, that one is too hard for me. I lock the Bible, I put it down, and I go do something else. Because I say, no, that one, that one is too hard. That one, no, that one is too hard for me. No, mm -mm. no. Until my, my spirit, you know, wrestled with the matter and settled and say, okay, Jesus, I will do what you want me to do. Because you are God anyway. Can any man fight you? So you see, I agree with... Um, Pastor Diana, that obedience has a limit. It does. It does have a limit. Shamara, let me hear from you. Yes, sir. I really believe that obedience it is um has some level of limit to it because of our own self. 
I don't think that we would be able to do what the Lord no. asks us to do because we 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 would if, when I think about the box that the lady gave the, the, the pastor sorry it would have to be God that holds us and remind us that we are on a mission because we know our hand would have broke <laughs> and that their hand would have gone clean 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 unless the Lord is with you so sometimes we're there saying oh we would just uh, sir some of us we're not coming from anywhere too good and we and worse jamaican we not have no behavior it's just the grace of god keeping some of us and the lord would definitely you know sometimes when you look you see you find yourself in some No. I think, uh, I think you're breaking up. yourself. Okay, I think you're breaking up there, but I I get the gist of of what you are saying there. Yes, some of us have no behavior at all, and some of us Christians are not ready for the road, because I'm telling you, once you go on the road, you are going to encounter some things. You are going to encounter some things and dealing with your enemy. There are certain protocols that Jesus have, has in terms of how we deal with our enemy. Now, here is another question I want to. Okay, Kay, go ahead before I go to that other point. Hi, good night. Good night. Um, <laughs> Prophet, I was watching the video that you just played there with the pastor. And I was saying, I mean, he is so humble because the lady actually took her hands and put it at his throat and he just smiled, you know, and, you know, for me, I'm like, how come, you know, his reflex, you know, when someone attack you, you immediately respond because if it was me, I think she wouldn't get hit back, you know, cause I would have just respond in a defensive way and he just he just smiled <laughs> you know the pastor just smiled like you know you know i mean that's a life lesson for me that you know i don't know what he was thinking or if he's interact you know had this interaction so many times that he's just so calm you know but uh, wow because i would have hit her back i would have hit her back you know, you see the difference between practical Christianity and theoretical Christianity? Hmm? Here, here is the difference now. This is the difference because many of us, all we have is theoretical Christianity. We don't have practical Christianity. And our practicality is even seen in the way we pray. How do we even pray? concerning our enemies. That's, that's a whole different um, kettle of fish right there. Who do you thunder fire? And who do you leave to God? When do you allow yourself to take the licks? And when do you allow God to, do, to, to be your defense? Th these are some real things that you know, we will have to discuss um, in time. Um, when, when we get there, there's so, so many life lessons that we, we need to learn here. But uh, does God expect us to be obedient to our leaders and those in authority, no matter what? Does God expect absolute obedience? Is that what the Bible teaches? Let's clear up some things here. Sister Carly. Go ahead, please. I'm not sure if it is in response to this question or the one before, but go ahead. Hi, good night. Um, Prophet, I, I'm thinking that there is a limit to where, to, to, I mean, to our approach to the whole thing, how far we think we can go or push ourselves. Um, I'm just thinking that there is, um, there's, there's somewhere in the Bible where it talks about I think when Jesus was interacting, he said that if, um, if you go wherever and um, they refuse to hear the word, then you would dust, you dust off your feet and you move on. So I'm think I am, 
more or less be guided by that. Yes, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you would, I mean, after some abuse and all of that, and you have tried, then you would just move on. I wouldn't really go back to, um, to, to attempt to convert or to, to convince anybody. Let somebody else do that. You know, so I think I think there is a limit to to to, to, the, to, the, to all of this. But but at what point, Sister Carol? At what point do you dust off your feet? Because here is the thing. Here is the thing. You might go to a person one time; they reject you. Eh? What if the person needs ten visits, but you dust off? At, well, at if the person needs 10 visits, well, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. So what if the person needs 10 visits and you dust off your feet at visit number one? You see? No, well, after the, after the first, after the first um, abuse, mm -hmm. I think that that should be it. And then, and then again, it also depends on the context. Because maybe the, the, um, the, the minister felt that the, odd, the odds were against him. I mean, mm -hmm. based based on the environment within which he was, he was. I mean, it, given a Jamaican situation, like I saw a clip in some time ago where this man, this this evangelist was preaching, and this man was there trying to trying to inter, I mean, inter, inter, interfere with him, and he um he kicked him, you know, and th th there was some inter, you know entanglement with with both of them, and the, the pastor with the evangelist was there to hold in position. And yeah. he was in the middle. He was in, a, he was in full flight preaching. Yes, all your right? position. Yes. Yes, and I'm saying I'm thinking that there has there has got to be a limit, and I'm <laughs> thinking that you know maybe we would we, we should hear God when He says that this is it. Let somebody take over. It's like when you decide to pray, pray about something, and you you cannot you figure that you cannot reach. You know, or get the answer. Then, then you get. Then you ask for help. Yes. I am not. You know, because the Bible says we must be wise, and I would not really want to expose myself for the for the whole community to mock me. Mm -hmm. So I so, I would move on and probably seek help. <laughs> but if you can't move, them already mock you. <laughs> well, you that's a different thing. But then, but but then profit. At yeah. some point, if you know that the situation or the area is a volatile area, I mean, it will be foolhardy of me to want to go inside there just alone. But the, the <laughs> Apostle John is right here before us. This man goes into territory eh, that is hostile, seriously hostile, right? Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim territories. That if you say the name Jesus, you could get a bullet without a question. Hmm? These are the territories this man of God is in, you know. And he's happy to go into these territories to well, preach guess, the gospel. Yes, prophet, I guess not everybody is a Stephen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I bring it out. Mm -hmm. I know I would bring it out. Yes. yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, that's my take on it. I think there's a limit to it, to be honest with you. There's a limit. Okay. Yes, see, I think there's a limit. And we have to use wisdom. Yes, we have to use wisdom. However, here is where the limit is. When a man is asking you to do something that is blatantly, outrightly against the word of God in principle, in precept and in practice, I have no business being obedient to that man. Agree. That's that's hands down. Okay, mm -hmm. hands down. Two, when a man is asking you to do something that is contrary to an instruction that God has given to you, I have a decision to make whether or not I'm going to obey that man or obey God. Are you following me? Yes. Because you see, this is where a lot of us get ourselves in trouble. We, because of the respect, honor, and loyalty we have for our leaders, 
we superimpose them over the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives as individuals and we sidetrack what the Holy Spirit will say to us as individuals and we listen to them and what they have to say and at the end of the day we end up being disobedient to God rather than um, being disobedient to man and that's the kind of situation that Peter and John found themselves in when they were preaching the gospel and were beaten for preaching the gospel. They said, would we rather to obey man or God? And they said, we choose God. You see, this is where we have to strike a balance where we allow people to know that one, God speaks to you. You don't have to be a prophet for God to speak to you. You don't have to be an apostle for God to speak to you. If you're a child of God, any at all, he speaks to you. Number two, because God speaks to you, it doesn't make you to become Superman. It doesn't make you to be super elite. You are still accountable one to another, which means that if God is giving you an instruction, you're under a particular kind of leadership, eh? and God is giving you an instruction uh, for a particular way that you should go or whatever, why would you keep that instruction to yourself? Speak to your leaders, talk to your leaders, as long as they are people you can communicate with and talk with and reason with. Because if you can't communicate and reason with them, then what's the sense being led by them? Because you will have things that you might need to discuss and discuss openly. And so there are times when you might want to go a certain way because you feel like this is what God is, how God is leading you. But when you speak to your leader, you might realize that, okay, now is not the time. So you'll get probably wisdom on how right. to proceed with the matter. You understand? So th there has to be that place of peace and comfort between us both where we can dialogue with each other where we can understand each other, understand how God leads you, understand how God speaks to you, and you understand how God speaks to me. And we can come to that place of, you know, um, commonality and understanding. Because if that doesn't happen, the result then is going to be that, okay, you are trying to do something that your leader does not approve of. Listen, your leader sometimes will never approve of some of the instructions yes. that God will give to you. I, I agree with the um, prophet, and I'm also thinking that um, if the Lord gives you an assignment and said you're, you're to go into an area which you might think twice or nearly to go, I am thinking that he, chances are, he would provide an escape route in the, in, in the event of any, you know, eventuality, you understand me? So I'm thinking that, yes, there, he would have made that provision for an escape in the event that you come up against something that you, you know, that could be life threatening. And we, we in whatever are... form or whatever way he he yes. he just just like in those days or, or even now, you know, when you when you when you're back against the wall, where you don't know where help come from, but help but help come. Yes. And yes, he may provide an escape route, sometimes he may not, because it might just be his will for you to come home. In that, in that way, I, I I I agree with that. But then and then again, he probably could, you know, he would probably would want to find an escape route, provide an escape route for you, because there are many more persons to be saved. Which exactly. you have to evangelize, you know. Right. So with whichever way it goes, well, let's 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 continue in in this yeah. in matter. Um, let's see if we can wrap up this um, tonight. When we talk about the concept of disobedience, there are so many areas to go into. Disobedience, where did this begin? Of course, in the Garden of Eden, when God instructed man not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The command was what? Do not eat. That was the command. However, Adam and his wife did what? Willfully, maliciously disobeyed God, and they ate that fruit. Now, the act of disobedience does not stop 
at Adam. It has come down to us and it has touched our lives also. I don't think there is anybody on this line who at some point in time was not disobedient in their life, whether to parents, whether to, to, to leaders in different capacities. At some point in time, you exhibited that little spirit there called disobedience hmm? at some point in time. So you are, you are as guilty as I am in that, in that area. Hmm? That's on your record. Now, what's the danger of disobedience? What are the dangers of this thing? Disobedience distorts our vision. It prevents us from seeing clearly the vision of Christ for our lives. It distorts our vision. Jonah that we are looking at, his vision became distorted. What was he seeing? He was seeing a people that he did not like, a people that he thought did not deserve mercy, a people that he thought should just be blown off the face of the earth without any chance of rescue. And you're not talking just men and women, you're talking about babies, you're talking about young boys, young girls, you're talking about those who are innocent even amongst them. Jonah did not consider that. And so there are times when we will have to rethink our methods and have a look back at our hearts. If we do certain things, if we uh, you know, will certain things into being, what are the consequences? What are the outcomes? Are there people who are innocent, who could be caught in the crossfire that shouldn't be caught in the crossfire? Disobedience is an open door to demonic operations in our lives. The Bible tells us that rebellion, which is also disobedience, is the same in the same category as witchcraft. So you don't have to have a candle and some juju oil to be practicing witchcraft. Just disobey God's instruction and you're automatically a witch or a wizard. Wow. <laughs> wow. Then disobedience cuts us off from God. If we are disobedient, that means we are acting contrary to what God commands us to do. And so it would affect our relationship with God. Look at what happened with Jonah. He was cut off from the land of the living and cut off from God. And his prayer was for God to bring him back to the land of the living and to bring back the relationship that he had with God, to restore him. So we know that disobedience affects our relationship with God. It does. Jonah was disobedient. He was literally plunged into darkness, the belly of the fish. There was no candle in the fish belly. Them cartoons where you see them putting candle in the fish belly is only cartoon. You hear? It was utter darkness. Utter darkness was down there. So if the man was literally alive, inside of that belly there. If him open him eyes, is seawater inside of that. So he have to shut it anyway. The man was in utter darkness, okay? For three days and for three nights, the man never sees sun. So what do we learn about disobedience? It puts us into a place of darkness. It isolates us. Whether we are disobedient to God or we are disobedient to a legitimate authority, it will push us into a place of darkness. Disobedience cannot bear any good fruit. The fruit will be corrupt. The fruit will be evil. The fruit will be undesirable. And no one will want to associate with a person who bears evil fruit. If they like you in the initial stage, at some point in time, they're going to want to uh, separate from you. So when we look at this whole matter of disobedience, what we are realizing, what we are recognizing is that this 
issue will bring serious separation, serious separation between us and God. It's a very, very serious issue. Am I being heard? Yes, you are. Okay. It's a very, very serious issue. And it is something that we ought to take note of and ensure that we deal with this spirit in our life. This is a very, very serious matter. And so I want to stop here tonight. I think my system has frozen on me. I can't do anything. I want to stop here tonight and um, we will pick up on this next week um, as we continue on this whole matter of disobedience. But there are so many areas that we can begin to examine in our life. Disobedience against God, disobedience against parents, disobedience against uh, leadership, legitimate leadership, disobedience against, you know, legitimate authority. How, how are we measuring up as Christians to this? And what kind of changes do we need to make so that the enemy will not lay an accusation against our life? This is a very, very serious issue. Amen and amen. Pastor Diana, please stop the recording for me. My system has frozen. I can't do anything. Hallelujah.